I think a lot of you have actually been probably out in the field with Dave, so, uh, or at least know him prior to this. 1972, I first met David Wilcox as a graduate student at the University of Arizona. He was carrying around this gigantic Chinese dictionary. Um, and <laughs> Dave always carries things to um, perhaps not their logical extremes. I think they're even beyond the logical extremes. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> the, <laughs> but he's had a, an amazing career uh, here in the state of Arizona. Uh, graduated, uh, became a Hoacom uh, specialist, uh, somewhat perhaps not by his initial choosing, and has, has led us to creative thinking uh, about Hoacom, uh, looking at the Southwest on, on much bigger scales, uh, worked at Arizona State University, had majority of his career up at uh, Museum of Northern Arizona, and I think he's back in the position that he really always has relished most of itinerant scholar. So uh, our itinerant scholar tonight will be speaking on his Verde, excuse me, his uh, Hilltop survey work. And uh, about 35 minutes from now, uh, we'll be doing uh, gyrations in the back so that we'll transition so that you will have opportunities to ask questions. And I will bring the microphone around and we'll uh, continue to the conversation with Dave. So Dave, uh, if I offended in any way, I apologize, but uh, <laughs> it's all yours. The first uh, hilltop site I studied in Arizona was a place called Tumamak Hill in Tucson uh, on the west side of town. Uh, <clears throat> I was the graduate student uh, representative to the Arizona Archaeology and Historical Society in 1975, and uh, we organized the research team to study various aspects of that archaeological site and, and related sites. Uh, and I studied the dry laid walls that are found up at the top of the hill. And uh, the, our team then published the whole issue of Kiva. Uh, and in my essay, I argued that those walls had been put there for defensive purposes uh, to protect the settlement that is found uh, at the top of the hill. Now, since that time, a lot, of, a lot more work has been done on that site a wonderful work um, uh, led by Paul and Susie Fish, largely. And uh, they found early agricultural remains there. The, the, the habitation site is much earlier than we thought at the time uh, uh, that we did our work. Uh, but I persist in thinking that those walls still were uh, mainly for defense uh, against the opinions of some other people. <laughs> uh, and it's what started me down the road of trying to understand warfare in the archaeological record. Uh, how can you get at that uh, in archaeology? Uh, and in the 1990s, years later, I met a guy uh, named Jerry Robertson, who'd been a captain in the 101st Airborne in Vietnam, had real military experience. I had uh, not evaded. That's the wrong word. Let's see. I got out of the draft somehow. Uh, <laughs> didn't go to Vietnam. <laughs> um, I was in college. That's what it was. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, at any rate, uh, I began talking to him. He gradually uh, was willing to talk to me about his uh, military uh, perspective on, on archaeological sites. And in 1997, Scott Wood, who's here, took us on a field trip out to a place called Perry Mesa, many of you know. Uh, it's about 50 miles north of Phoenix. Uh, and there's a settlement system of small pueblos out there, dating mainly in the 1300s. Uh, and I was talking to Jerry about, well, if he had to defend one of these, how would he do? How do you think about it? And with his military eye, what would he uh, point us toward? And early warning was one of the ideas that he had. Um, and uh, the idea then of smoke signals or fire at night. Uh, and uh, Scott and I knew that uh, prior to the Prairie Mesa settlement system, uh, in all of West Central Arizona, there were a lot of hilltop sites that had been known. Uh, many of them had been re reported as early as the 1850s, uh, and uh, many of them had been studied subsequently. And they date, though, from about 11 heights thought, about 1100, AD 1100 to about 12, I'd say now 1275, whereas Perry Mesa settlement system that we see, uh, I think, dates mainly about 1275 to maybe 1400, maybe a little later. 
So they're successive. Uh, or you could put it the other way, the, the hilltop site pattern in all of west central Arizona uh, is antecedent to what we see on Perry Mesa. Well, Scott and I and Jerry uh, Robertson got together to study the Perry Mesa settlement system. Uh, and uh, 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 Jerry had some, some, I think, seminal ideas about it. First question he asked is, why would anybody want to attack Perry Mesa? And at the time, we didn't have an answer to that. Uh, and so then he said, well, okay, suppose they're the aggressor. Maybe what they're afraid of is retaliation. And so they've arranged themselves on the Mesa in such a way that they could prevent uh, a successful attack against them from the outside. And so that led to the question of who are their, who are their friends and who are their enemies? Uh, and uh, we uh, began to look into that question. But we also began to look into the question of antecedents. Uh, who, what, was, what, what was true out in West Central Arizona before the time of Perry Mesa? And was, did, did what we see in the defensive system we thought was present at Perry Mesa, uh, we thought also was uh, capable of resisting a, an attack of a much greater force than was perhaps true earlier. So we had some of these ideas, and we've published a series of papers or monographs about all of this since then. Um, and today I wanted to focus uh, uh, primarily on the question of, of hilltop sites prior to Perry Mesa, but come back to Perry Mesa and that idea of, of why would anybody want to attack a place like that. Um, in 2010, uh, there was a, what's called a Southwest Symposium that was held in Hermosillo, Mexico, and I was asked uh, to do a poster in a session about warfare in the Southwest, and I produced this poster, uh, the Arizona Archaeology uh, Society, uh, Verde Valley chapter uh, paid for it, uh, and um, uh, I've been giving talks about it ever since, <laughs> including tonight. <laughs> uh, and um, it synthesizes uh, what we've done about studying hilltop sites uh, in, in West Central Arizona uh, starting in the late uh, 1990s. Uh, I first met uh, a, a site steward named uh, Judith Rowe Taylor and her hiking friends. Uh, she introduced me to a fellow in Prescott named Joseph Vogel, uh, who was also a site steward, but he also happened to own two small planes and loved to fly. And so we went flying with him and, and on that flight actually found a, a hilltop site that hadn't been known before, just east of Perry Mesa. I call it the Rosalie Lookout now. It's a walled enclosure up there and you can see down to, to the big site at Squaw Creek Ruin from there. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we, Joe got excited about uh, doing this and began then doing it on his own. I was at the Museum of Northern Arizona at the time in charge of the site files, and so he'd send me a packet with information. He had digital cameras today, you know, and, and uh, GPS in his plane. He can track his route. He can get really good locational data on the sites that he was seeing from the air and, uh, and good pictures of them. And so we began to assign site numbers to them and then try to hike out to them. Now he got a little ahead of us. Uh, uh, he started in 1998 uh, and is, is still flying. He was already in his late 60s at the time I met him. He's now in his late 80s, still flying. Uh, he's already recorded over a thousand sites from the air in all of West Central Arizona. Uh, and uh, now he's not the only one though that had that kind of interest in Prescott before him in the 1970s there was a guy named Kenneth Austin uh, who also retired uh, to Prescott in his 70s and 80s he also recorded a thousand sites in the Prescott area in pedestrian survey on the ground survey uh, many of them were hilltop sites which he was very interested in he did a study of line of sight uh, you can see from one to the other and he thought that had something to do with potential for communication uh, which we agree with, we think that as well. And so as we began to hike up to these places, we're looking for the ones out on the landscape around us. And as we became more and more familiar, we could begin to tell, well, this is where that site is and that's where that site is. Uh, and so line of sight was a measurable relationship that we can see in the archeological record. Uh, you can't see smoke signals anymore. I mean, that's, they're gone. Uh, but you can talk about the potential for them. Uh, and I think that's of interest. Uh, um, and now we've shown, and this, there's a map here on this poster uh, that shows a study of line of sight using the computer that another of my uh, friends, Tom Weiss, uh, did uh, of over 200 sites, uh, looked at the line of sight between them. 
uh, and we see a network all through West Central Arizona, uh, at least along the Agua Fria, out to the, from, from say Lake Pleasant and New, New River north all the way through Prescott up to the Mogollon Rim and out west to Burrow Creek, if you know where Burrow Creek is, or Kirkland Creek uh, to the west. Uh, and, um, and then on the east side, there's the Black Hills. So you know Mingus Mountain and the Black Hills that come on down. We don't have a we don't have a line of sight across them uh, very well, uh, uh, and we haven't really studied it to the east uh, at this point. Uh, but um, anecdotally, we know that there is uh, quite a bit of line of sight among the sites we do know on to the east there, and it looks like there's a boundary now to me uh, along the Black Hills. Now Scott Wood had had a concept that initially based on ceramic studies that he called the Central Arizona tradition. So if you think of Phoenix, if you think of, of the Salt River Valley, Lower Salt River Valley, and, and the Middle Gila Valley, we call that whole area the Phoenix Basin. Um, and that's where you get these large Hoacom villages, uh, uh, some of them probably with a thousand people or more, uh, uh, at least uh, by the 10 hundreds, maybe earlier. Um, and every three miles, uh, you have these villages. Um, and originally they had ball courts as a ceremonial facility, many of them have plazas, we think we've shown. Um, later they have mounds, or platform mounds they're called, like Pueblo Grande is one of the biggest, or Mesa Grande is, is the second biggest, uh, or both of them are, they're, they're both the same size. <laughs> they're, they're different by a couple of cubic meters. <laughs> which you can learn from Turney, 1929, <laughs> and Jerry Howard's dissertation. <laughs> uh, and uh, so um, uh, what's the relationship then between these populations of these village dwelling, irrigating people, thousands of people, Jerry and I have uh, estimated that at the height, about 1300, there might've been as many as 12 to 15,000 people in the Salt River Valley. Some people estimate somewhat smaller than that. Uh, but um, uh, in studies that began on Perry Mesa, looking at who's, who their neighbors are, uh, I began to look at all sites, 13 rooms or larger in all of West Central Arizona that dated in the 1300s, and we made a map, which we published, and it's in this poster. Um, and um, one thing led to another, and so we kept, it wasn't that hard to do, it turned out, and so we kept going, uh, and we also published a map of all known sites, 13 rooms or larger, in all of East Central Arizona. Uh, and then soon, uh, about that same time, in about uh, AD 2000, I was talking to a fellow named Dave Gregory, a colleague of ours, and we came up with the idea of studying Zuni origins, and uh, we wanted to continue making maps of all these neighbors of one another, and we did finally make a, a database of all known sites, 13 rooms or larger, throughout all of the North American Southwest from maybe 1200 to 1600. Uh, and that's published in a, in a small volume, it's only 500 pages in triple column, called Zuni Origins. <laughs> so if you need any light reading, I recommend it highly. <laughs> uh, it's good, especially at night, you know, when you wake up and <laughs> you sit up in bed. And you can get one of those lights, you know, on your head and you can sit there. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we old people do, you know. <laughs> Can't sleep, you know. So, so anyway, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of stuff published out there about what came of all these ideas that we began uh, on Perry Mesa, um, and about the hilltop sites. Um, and we found there's a lot of diversity among them. Uh, the more we got to know them and to see them. Uh, the way the walls are built of walled enclosures that are found on these sites, it's, it's much the same technique throughout this whole vast area. Uh, but um, uh, some of them, though, are habitation sites, small pueblos uh, on butte tops. Uh, some of these, in fact, most of them are very defendable, uh, and they have arrangements that they made to defend uh, those locations. Uh, we just mapped one in Hackberry Basin south of Camp Verde called Dorrance Castle. Uh, and it has about a 50 year old Pueblo at the top of this butte. And it has, if it has two stories, it might be as much as 75 rooms. Uh, and uh, down below it, there's a wall, a massive wall uh, that surrounds it. And there's an access uh, through the wall that's one person wide. And it comes out as a funnel 
up above there's another wall where people with bows could have shot down and prevented anybody really from, from, from entering the site. Very defendable place, uh, and many of them are uh, maybe not quite as elaborate as that site, but similar kinds of arrangements were made. Um, and uh, then also, though, we have walled enclosures uh, that maybe have a room, maybe don't. Uh, and some of them have ceramics, many of them don't have any ceramics. Uh, we date them based just on the association of other sites in the, in close by, uh, but the, the wall construction technique is the same as all of these, you see. Um, then you also have others that I increasingly think might have had religious purposes, um, and that's more difficult to get at archaeologically, I think, uh, but we've begun to have some new ideas about that. Um, uh, and um, they may have been uh, thought of as sacred mountains, uh, places where you could go up and, and have ceremonies. They're up in the sky. Uh, you could look at the sky, uh, and uh, they may have been conceptions of the interactions with the sky uh, and the earth uh, that could have gone on in places like this. The idea that Ken Austin had and others uh, have had that some of these places are, are uh, retreats where people in danger could go and, and protect one another, um, uh, we've looked at. Uh, but the more I look at it, the less convinced I am. If you're standing inside a walled enclosure, the wall is this high, and, and the rocks at the top tip in, you can see it's, it's still there just the way they built it. Uh, there's no evidence of a roof. Uh, how are you going to defend yourself if you're standing inside something like that? Jump up and shoot? You know, <laughs> uh, It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so I increasingly am looking for alternative explanations for some of these places. Uh, and uh, there is an idea uh, uh, that has been suggested in parts of the Southwest and in Mes Mesoamerica. Uh, it's called an Axis Mundi. Uh, it's, a, it's a power uh, uh, relationship between the upper world, the middle world, and the underworld. Uh, and that uh, it might be embodied in places like the back part of Bubba Benito, it's been argued. Uh, I think you could look at Wapaki uh, uh, Pueblo, which is a tower and see the same thing. Uh, Ridge Ruin in Flagstaff, I think, can be seen that way. Uh, when you look at the Casa Grande Ruin, many of you know the Casa Grande Ruin, uh, it was studied by a fellow named Frank Hamilton Cushing uh, in the 1880s. Uh, he'd already been to Zuni Pueblo and learned a language and knew a lot about Zuni religion, uh, and he had an interpretation of it. If you've been to the Casa Grande, you know that it's a rectangular structure with five rooms, right? on the ground, on, a, on the second and third story, and then one room in the center at the top. So down the center, you have an upper, a nadir, uh, uh, or zenith room, a middle room, and a nadir, a lower room. Uh, and then you have the four corners of the universe. And this is how Cushing interpreted it. Well, that's what an axis mundi is about, is those relationships. Uh, he didn't use that term, but I think that's exactly what he's talking about. So I've started to think that these are important ideas. And that already we may be seeing some of that in some of these hilltop sites. Um, uh, so I think we need to, uh, as I increasingly say now, keep our powder dry and our minds open about what some of these things mean uh, and try to find new ways to test scientifically uh, the ideas we have about them. Now, in our original Perry Mesa uh, work, uh, we thought uh, that uh, on Perry Mesa you have the Hour Fria comes down uh, through and then there's side drainages that cut down into it a thousand feet down to the base of the drainage and there are pueblos that block access on each of those uh, side drainages and then out around a, a thing and they form an overall an oval distribution and Jerry Robertson said well think of a castle uh, you know a European castle think of a castle here's the wall of the castle well the walls are the, the cliffs and the strong points in the castle are the pueblos and this is then abstractly uh, a, a castle defense, uh, he suggested, uh, which I think was a, a wonderful insight uh, into the, the abstract relationships that we'd already recognized. We'd seen that, that if people were trying to come up onto the mesa from the outside, uh, they could be blocked. Uh, and that the way people were deployed there, they could protect one another's, one another's backs uh, from some kind of outside attack. Well, this castle defense idea creates an abstract way of thinking about that, um, which I think is very, very interesting. Now, what did Perry Mesa have that anybody wanted? He had asked. 
The same can be said about any of these small sites uh, in all of West Central Arizona, the part of what Scott's called the Central Arizona tradition from AD 1100 to 1275. When you look at the habitation sites, um, they're small. Uh, you know, they're less than 50 rooms. Uh, very few are more than 50 rooms. I have one I think might be 80, uh, but 50 otherwise it would be about the biggest. Uh, many of them are 25 or 15 or 10 um, rooms. And if you figure, you know, one or two people per room, you get some idea of the population, it's not big. Um, now, in the Phoenix Basin, however, you're talking about villages of 1,000 people or more, or 600 people, or you know, that, that kind of scale, every three miles. Uh, they're the big boy on the block, and when we put together this coalescent communities database I was talking about, and you compare the Phoenix Basin to other parts of the Southwest, in that period of, of uh, 1,300 to 1,400, or even 1,200 to, to uh, 1,400, it's the biggest, demographically, it's the biggest place anywhere in the Southwest. Uh, in those data, even if you take the lower estimates for overall size. Um, and so they were the big boy on the block. And here up in these hills, up in the hinterlands to the north, uh, there are some of these small populations, um, um, uh, you know, how are you going to defend yourself against those? Uh, uh, well, maybe you're raiding them because they've got, they've got corn, they've got cotton textiles, they've got lots of things you might want to go get if you could sneak in and get out, um, and then you might get chased. So that was our original idea. Uh, but the other thing they're doing down here in the valley, uh, as Jerry Howard can tell you far more than I can, they were building canals. And they didn't just build them and then use them, they built them and then they rebuilt them and then they rebuilt them again and they rebuilt them and then in some places they had to clean them out, you know, and clean them out and clean them out. And so you have a lot of labor. And so the more I've thought about that, I've thought that, you know what, maybe what these people up here in, uh, in West Central Arizona had was people, and uh, young people. And that what's happening is from 1100 on, uh, which is the beginning of what we call the classic period in the Holocom archeological sequence, uh, that uh, maybe, uh, and this is just a theory, that they needed more labor, uh, than they had locally, they had in their own villages. Uh, and they begin to go, go get some from their neighbors. And what we see happening is that that area between uh, the river, Salt River, and New River, you all know you've driven I-17 how many times, and you know what's the milepost when you get to New River? 32 miles, so it's 30 miles. Well, that's over a day's travel on foot with a pack walking. Uh, you could probably run it in a day, but uh, not you and me, but these, <laughs> the people that used to live there could. Uh, but I certainly couldn't. But, but, um, and and that there had been villages out there, Palo Verde. Some of you know about the Palo Verde ruin that was studied by Mark Hackbarth and others, for example. Uh, it's there until about 1100. It had a ball court, had a valley pottery. Uh, Mark uh, says that maybe it's, somebody was hanging on until maybe 1150, but after that, there's nobody home out there in that 30 miles. It's what we call a buffer zone, or sometimes a no man's land, it's been called. Uh, and it's a kind of thing you see when you look at these things worldwide. When people are in conflict with one another, you often get buffer zones, because what it does is it reduces uh, or increases the, the, the labor it takes, or the energy it takes to fight one another. Uh, you have to really Go get into it if you're going to cross that and then fight and come back. Uh, and so it's a commonly found uh, relationship that's, that's seen in situations of that kind. Um, and so it's a 30 mile buffer zone uh, that's set up around 1100, 1150. Uh, and that's when this hilltop pattern in further north is, is in place. Uh, small sites, though, um, you know, uh, I think that if they could have sent. 20 men uh, to get people, or 100 men. Uh, it's questionable how safe some of those places would be. Uh, later on, after 1275 in the valley, what you see is pl these platform mounds are big, high places, with, and by 1275, they're beginning to build structures on top of them, including towers. And from those, you could see where the compounds, where most people were living in these villages, 
you know, from one to the other, you could have signaled back and forth. Jerry Robertson called compounds a redoubt. They're a, they're a place you could protect yourself, at least temporarily. But if you, it was part of a larger integrated system of communication, pe you know, people could bring to bear uh, flanking forces and other things to protect a particular compound if it was found itself under attack and could have reported that back. Uh, so I think the whole valley, and, and, and it's known that from one platform mound, uh, you could see the others. Frank Cushing rode his horse up on him and could do that in the 1880s. Uh, and so I think the whole valley had become a, a, an integrated defensive system by 1300, maybe earlier, uh, but at least by then, uh, or 1275, I was saying. But, um, now, and that's when we see Perry Mesa set up with this castle defense. Jerry Robertson thought that even if you, they had sent 1,000 men against Perry Mesa uh, with those narrow canyons, you'd get up there, then you had to climb up 1,000 feet to get up on top, and they wouldn't all get there at the same time. Uh, and so if you had early warning, you could mobilize yourself and prevent them uh, from getting at you, was his idea. He thought they could have, you know, they had a chance uh, in that situation. Uh, but that's a scale. Uh, a lot larger than, say, 10 guys or 20 guys coming at you. If you've got 1,000 guys coming at you, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a whole different kind of proposition. Uh, for, for an analogy, if, if you know the story of Kit Carson in the 1860s who went into Canyon de Chez against the Navajo, he had horses and guns. He took about 1,000 men. Uh, but... Um, uh, all he did was kill a few people, but he cut down peach trees, he destroyed stored goods, and he got out. And soon after that, 6,000 Navajo gave up and came in and were marched off to Bosque Redondo in New Mexico, causing regional abandonment. Well, I think another pattern we see here is these hilltop sites I've been talking about across this whole vast area of west central Arizona, they all go away by about 1275. And they shrink, and what you see is where population is, is present after that is in the middle verde where it's, you've got the river and water and to the upper verde at Perkinsville and then down the verde down to, to where Horseshoe Reservoir is today and to Davenport Wash just below that. On Perry Mesa you see a, a, a coalescence is the word I'm using into small villages on uh, Bloody Basin between the verde and Perry Mesa, a place called Poli's Mesa. Um, and... Um, it's in the core central area, most watered area though, of what had been this larger domain that we call the Central Arizona tradition. Um, a fundamental change takes place, and it looks like it happens just about the same time that the valley people got their act together in this new kind of defensive system using compounds and walls around the platform mounds that they'd squared up by this time and begin to build structures on top. That's when that all begins to happen all at once. There's a correlation there. So I built a theory of warfare based on that. Um, and the proposition now would be if labor was really what was at stake, uh, A, uh, uh, they're still after it. B, uh, it might have been harder for them to get it, uh, uh, but uh, maybe they still had a need to do so. Now, it's gonna be people like Jerry that's gonna be able to tell us whether there were those needs, I don't know. You know. Uh, I'm just looking at it and seeing, boy, that's a lot of canals they were building and cleaning out. Uh, but it, it may be possible to test some of these ideas in a little more refined way uh, as we go forward. Uh, but I've changed my mind then about uh, the, what explains the, the kind of defensible patterns that we see on places like Perry Mesa and earlier in these hilltop systems, uh, many of which are very defendable, particularly the habitation ones, um, uh, that, that whereas initially we argued they were the aggressor, they're raiding against... Uh, these agricultural people down in the valley. And if you know your, your uh, history, the Yavapai and the Apache raided against the Pima and Maricopa in that way, from that, in these same zones in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, but the, the irrigation systems the Pima and Maricopa had are much smaller, much lower, lower level kinds of organization than the whole commons uh, were. And so it's really not comparable uh, and, uh, to, to very much. Uh, interesting though that relationship was. Uh, so I think we need to think further about what could be going on here. But anyway, I've been led to some of these ideas, uh, trying to keep my powder dry, my mind open, looking for new interpretations of some of these hilltop sites, beginning to have some ideas about uh, religious rela relationships now. 
And that, that's something I've thought of since they did this paper. Uh, but if you, if you want to hear a PowerPoint about it, I'd be happy to come and talk. <laughs> As some of you have <laughs> gritted your teeth and listened to me do that. So anyway, I think I'm going to stop now. How's that, Bill? And, and uh, ask for questions. Miracles do happen. <laughs> Good job. You just Dave. haven't seen me in action very <laughs> recently. <laughs> so uh, Dave is now open for questions. I've told the folks at that table that they can only have very, very kind and calm questions. So, um, but anyone else can. He, it's you're open for business. Okay, Ellen. Here, uh, let me go up with the yeah, microphone. Yeah, he wants to give you a microphone. I don't know who's behind me. I have a reputation for asking questions. Um, the thing I was wondering about, if this is possibly true, that uh, the whole con people were going after labor, slave yeah. labor, whatever you want to call it, yeah, does student, that show up student, in the burial? Labor. That's good. Yeah. Does it show up in the burial records down here in the valley, like I, sites at the end of canals? I don't know. I think that's a, something that ought to be looked at, though. Um, if, if there are people who grew up in the hills, and then got down here and got buried down here. Maybe there's stuff in Strontium or whatever it is you can look at today that, you know, now today we're in the world of NAGPRA, however, you know, and so getting permission to do destructive analysis is a whole new kind of problem uh, for scientists. Uh, and whether it can be pursued, I don't know, but I think that in general, you know, it'd be lovely to know more about things like that. Uh, and that might be, you know, insightful, uh, but I don't know that we know that yet. Uh, but maybe someday we'll know things like that. Other questions? Uh, a basic question. Uh, just tell us what happened to, to all, of, all of these people. Okay. Uh, I got you to 1400. There were, you know, the big boy on the block was right here in the Salt River Valley, in the Gila Valley. Um, um, and this coalescent process had begun. We've only talked about central Arizona to this point, but it, that coalescent process actually had begun to happen all across the, the North American Southwest. Uh, and uh, profound changes had begun to happen in the overall structure of settlement systems throughout the Southwest. Uh, and what's going on here is a, is a part of that much larger story. Uh, and so go read Zuni Origins and you'll learn more about it. <laughs> uh, um, uh, basically, though, uh, what happens uh, in the Coalescent Communities Database, what you can see, we made it, we were able to make a series of maps. We made a histogram. We found out there are four size classes of, of, of uh, sites. Uh, 13 to 100 rooms is a hamlet. 100 to 250 rooms is a small village. 250 rooms to 99 rooms is a medium-sized village. 1,000 rooms or more are a large village. Um, and you can make a map that has symbols for each of those four classes. Uh, we, we were able to do a, a, a set of uh, uh, analyses that look at the potential for interaction among them, uh, and it creates nested sets around them of, of uh, basically circles that are, have jagged characteristics to them instead of just a nice circle the way I would draw. Uh, and, um, uh, and you can get it all on one page, and so you can see a 50-year interval and one, one eight and a half by 11 page uh, uh, with, with the sites. And if you know your sites in a particular area, you can even tell which site is which. It's just amazing that you can get it down that small and still be able to see the whole North American Southwest. And on that first map from 1200 to 1249, we can see that it would have been possible to go from one village to another without going more than a day, day after day, and you could have gotten anywhere uh, throughout the whole network across the whole North American South. It's all one social system. Uh, but you can already see, though, a, a boundary in there between the southern southwest uh, of the whole Com area out to Casas Grandes in the Chihuahua, northwestern Chihuahua, and the northern southwest. Uh, but initially, there's a set of networks that connected the two, uh, but gradually they go away. And so by 1400, they're gone, and you're left with what's left of the southern southwest and the, the Puebloan world of Hopi, Zuni, and the eastern Pueblos in the north. Uh, now in central Sonora, there also were thought to be sites 
And it could be the southern southwest sort of shrinks down into that area, uh, which is, I think, an interesting thing we need to think a lot more about uh, and don't really know much about at this point. Uh, but uh, basically, you can see that that division become, uh, between the northern and southern southwest becomes sharper and sharper, bigger and bigger buffer zones uh, develop between those two areas. Uh, and that's the general pattern you see. And by 1400, well, in the first map of 1200 to 1249, 75% of the rooms in all of the Southwest are in sites of 250 rooms or less. So they're in small villages or hamlets or farmsteads, which I didn't measure. Um, by 1450, in the Northern Southwest, half the rooms now that are still extant are in sites of 1,000 rooms or more. Some of them are 3,000 rooms. Um, and it's a fundamental transformation that takes place. Uh, and the end of the whole calm is, uh, in this valley, uh, they stop living in these sites, they stop living on Perry Mesa, they stop living in the Middle Verde, uh, but they continue to live at Hopi and at Zuni uh, and maybe in central, and, well, and we think in central Sonora, um, uh, in villages. Uh, uh, and it still remains to be explained why all of that happens. Uh, uh, we can describe it better now, I think, than we have been able to before. Um, and in more detail, but there's still a great many unanswered questions as to why it happened. In the Salt River Valley, though, um, studies of stream flow, as Dave Noel knows, uh, uh, that were done in the 1980s um, by our friend David Gregory and others, uh, argued that there'd been floods that, of, of, that were such that it blew out the canal system heads such that they couldn't restore them and it, may have missed, it would have caused famine right away. Jerry Howard has a somewhat different view of it, but he still sees a crisis at that time. Um, and so there may be external factors like that that are in play as chance factors in play as well that are part of the story uh, that uh, uh, we, we at least now know something about. Does that answer your question? <clears throat> well, I thought you might just say something like, that <laughs> they went to Hopi. No. <laughs> No, I, 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 I can tell I wasn't I, specific I, enough I in think, my question. I think the whole com <laughs> went to Central Sonora. I, I know think. that. Yeah. Well, uh, more relevant, I just I wanted to... I think that's on this poster, too, by the way. I think yeah, it's yeah, over yeah. the lower right or something. Yeah, yeah, it's on the poster. Uh, something, there's a, a new uh, issue of American Antiquity just came out, and there's a lead article in there by Bernardini and Peebles, I think, right, on site communities, very elaborate model of that this might in some way be related back to the issues you're, you're looking at. I think he, uh, I think they're talking about reference groups and, and that people relate to mountains and physical, physiographic features and, but you know, there, and then there's, there's a ritual component to it. So, um, I think it's good to think about things like that. Yeah. And it's just hot off the press, so it, yeah. it'll take a while. It gets very, yeah. I found it very complicated, so. Uh -huh. I haven't read it yet, so <laughs> I didn't think it was complicated at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I take it there was no, uh, there's no evidence of an external uh, force coming in to the Southwest. Well, I know a guy in the 50s, it used to be thought that the, the uh, Apaches came in and their, their language is called Athabascan, and so there's a song about the Athabascan bastards made the great Pueblo fall. Uh, and I know a guy who knows all the verses, actually, still to this day, but, uh, but uh, I early on looked into that and, and wrote a series of papers about it. Uh, it. It doesn't look like they're here early enough for them to have anything to do with it. Uh, and similarly, you have Yavapai, Wallapai, you have a Supai coming in probably from the west, although they would tell you maybe they've been here all the time uh, today. Um, uh, uh, none of these factors seem to have uh, been terribly important. Um, uh, Julian Hayden uh, took down stories from the, from the, what are today called the Tohono O'odham, the people living out in, in, in southwestern Arizona, uh, claiming that they had attacked the people in these big sites in the valley uh, uh, and taking them over, conquered them. Uh, and so that would be, you know, their cousins coming in and taking over. Uh, so there are a lot of different, you know, factors out there, theories or, or stories or, um, 
interesting things to think about, uh, hard to test. Right now, I think between, say, 1400, maybe 1450, uh, and when we first see real Pima living on the land, when Padre Aquino came in in the 1690s, um, you have a couple of centuries in there. And there's now some carbon-14 dates that are out there that sort of are in that interval. But as far as I know, they don't yet make a coherent story for continuity of anybody in, from one thing to the other. So I think it's still an open question scientifically uh, what's true uh, in that case. Um, um, and, um, um, you know, all these, all these uh, what I say generally is that archaeology takes centuries. <laughs> It's, a lot of these questions were thought about a long time ago and we're still thinking about them and we have a lot more information now, but, but in the end, these are complex problems and, and we don't have enough data still to really answer them fully. Uh, and so a lot of things are still open to question. Uh, you gotta keep our powder dry and our minds open. Other questions? Uh, sort of a two-part question. Okay. Um, I, I forgot your, your military gentleman friend's name. That Jerry. Uh, Jerry. Um, did he, when you were looking at these sites, did he differentiate um, what might have been more of a sustainable fort versus a lookout? And secondly, uh, any documentation research done on, on stores that they may have put at some of these, particularly sort of the one on the bottom left there, I know is a heck of a climb personally uh -huh. um, to get there. And, oh, and yeah, Pepsi yeah. Cap, yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to think of, you know, what, what stores would have been brought to there and to last a period of time. Mary, we have to take him to some other places. <laughs> uh, uh, you can just drive out Table Mesa Road and walk up the fence line. What do you mean? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, um, in the literature before Jerry Robertson came along, there were people that were making some of these comparisons of habitation sites that are fortified versus just a wall across the Mesa tip, and it's probably a lookout, you know or a walled, a wall, I call them walled enclosures. They're different shapes, but they, they enclose a space at the top of a hill uh, and have good, good you know, view sheds. Um, often no pottery at all on them. Um, I've been uh, uh, looking at, at, I mentioned in passing, ideas about the potential for interaction. And one of these is in the archeological literature, there's a, something called a catchment area how far you go out to get bunnies and you know, various kinds of wild foods and something on an everyday basis. And it's taken to be a seven kilometer you know, radius around your habitation uh, is, is a commonly seen kind of measure of that. And then uh, there's a question of how far you can walk in a day. And, and, and a measure of that is, has been in the literature that's 22 miles or 36 kilometers. And I like the idea of how far you can go and come back in a day, which would be let's say 18 kilometers. And I've been, I, I, I don't know how to do the kind of, it's called cost surface analysis that we did in the Zuni Origins book. Um, and so I just draw circles <laughs> as a crow flies. <laughs> and so I draw a seven kilometer circle and an 18 kilometer circle. And in doing that though, I found that a lot of these lookouts are on the perimeter of 18 kilometer circles. And it's occurred to me that what that means perhaps is that they could have supplied them on a daily basis. Goes, goes, kind of goes to your question. So you don't necessarily have storage facilities on site, but if they're close enough, you know, they, people could have been, you need to maintain somebody there if you're gonna maintain the communication system. That's just logic. Uh, how do you do that? Well, maybe you're getting people to go and come back uh, to keep them up there so they don't have to do that themselves. Uh, and they wouldn't need any pottery, uh, you know, either. Uh, but these are just ideas, you know. I mean, I think there's, facts that you can observe, you know, and, and there's established facts that you've, you know so much that you're virtually certain this is, this is true. And there's hypotheses that, you know, you hope to test, that you can find new facts, new relationships that will help test them. Uh, and then there's things that, you know, I think are just good to think about, whether you know how to test them or not. And we're out in that realm now, you know. Um, and, uh, Again, I, I just think we just need to be flexible about it. You know, don't, let's not get all you know, certain about things, but remember there's doubt here about what really is happening. But it's worth thinking about it. Maybe we'll think of then some ways to test some of these ideas. Uh, and I think that's where we are with questions like that right now. But there are 
habitation sites on these things that they were living there, lots of pottery, uh, and they were controlling that place and it's a long way to water. Why are they doing that, you know? Um, uh, so it does look like uh, they were worried about something. Another possibility, because I know of two places I have seen myself that are little places on hilltops where you can observe the horizon and check on seasons. Sure. Do, do any of your doorways in these hilltop sites face any place that's a cardinal direction? Um, um, Too soon to tell? Some, some of them have the walled enclosures in the greater Prescott area have what have been called gateways where the walls are offset a little bit. and. Uh, uh, but I, I, nobody has looked at that systematically, so I don't know that we know that. Uh, the one, if I'm thinking about the ones that I can readily bring to mind, I don't think there's any obvious correlation like that. Uh, at the site of Kraken Rock, you know where Kraken Rock is, north of Wapaki, uh, it's on the monument. Uh, there's a wall, there's a pueblo behind it, and there's holes through the wall. And there's some people who've, who've looked through them and at the horizon and think they see correlations and stuff. That's the only actual study of that kind that I can bring to mind, where somebody has thought that. Uh, but we were talking at dinner, though, I mean, a lot of these walls have holes in them, you know, that they go through a meter, and they're only this big. And you look through it, and you're not about to shoot anything through it. Uh, and, and when you look through it, you can't see much. So I don't think they're peepholes. You'd do better looking over the wall and ducking down. Uh, so what are they? Uh, but they don't, the ones I've looked through, you don't see the horizon. You do see the ground out in front. Uh, whereas in Kraken Rock, it's up higher, and I think you do, you can. Um, so things like that are worth asking, I think. It's worth trying to, trying to get out there and measure it and see what happens. Uh, but uh, um, we're looking for new ideas. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of thing you need to do to do that. Go ahead. So, so Dave, one You've used a lot of um, volunteers throughout your uh, projects, and do you want to just get, kind of make a little testimonial to oh, yeah. the people who've worked with you over the years? Well, um, I mentioned uh, Ken Austin, who I actually met, uh, and in 1978, he gave a talk in Tucson, which I heard, and I referenced it in my Tumamak Hill paper, uh, and then later I was able to edit and publish it in the first Prescott Conference volume. Um, when Scott and I got together with Jerry, Jerry's an avocational archeologist, um, and who got real excited about working with us, fool that he is, or was. <laughs> but we had a good time, I don't know. <laughs> I enjoyed it, <laughs> you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we learned a lot uh, from one another. Uh, and. Um, when, I, when we had this idea, well, we knew about all these hilltops, and, and I conceived this idea of a hilltop survey, and I met Judith Rowe Taylor, I mentioned, and we started working with her, and then Joe Vogel. But I also went down to Charlotte Hall Museum, where I knew the curator and the director at the time, and, and gave a talk. They invited me to give a talk in a collaborative way, and I solicited help. And this is where I met Tom and Sue Weiss and, and other people down there at that time who were very helpful uh, in the early stages of this and, and to this day in some cases, uh, in Tom and Sue's case. Um, and in the Verde Valley, uh, Joe Vogel had found some sites uh, from the air in a place called Sycamore Canyon, south of Camp Verde. And I asked my friend Jerry Earhart, who's in the Verde Valley chapter of the Arizona Archaeology Society, to go out and check them out and record them. He knew how to record sites uh, to Peter Pillis's uh, professional standards. And he did, but they found some other sites and they got interested in doing a survey. And here we are 10 years later and they've now recorded over 450 sites uh, to Peter's standards and done first rate ceramic studies of all of them. And, and uh, um, uh, it's, it's what we're calling an, an intensive reconnaissance uh, as they didn't walk transects and so you can't call it what's called a full coverage survey. But I think it's virtually that uh, in the way they've gone about it. Um, and um, uh, I now have, in the last few months, have been doing an intensive study of all of those data and I'm learning many more things. Uh, and if you go now to uh, the Smoke Eye Museum, do you know the Smoke Eye Museum in Prescott? Uh, they have a new curator now, Andy Christensen, who's a colleague of ours, a professional archeologist. And he has a new exhibit there about 
uh, avocational archaeology, and he prefers to call it amateur archaeology in the Prescott area, uh, and the interaction with professionals uh, over uh, about a century of time. Uh, and he wrote a, uh, wrote a small monograph about it, which is also available. Uh, and w the way he likes to think about it is, is that it's, it's, it's shared uh, creation of, of knowledge and of data. Uh, that I, can't, I couldn't have done any of this stuff without all that help, as Bill was indicating, uh, by myself. But on the other hand, I'm a spark plug that can help stimulate and direct and guide uh, and interact. Uh, and I know how to write it up, uh, you know, maybe more than some. But I'm really pleased to say that some of these folks have learned how to write it up as well. Uh, and I hope to put more and more on their shoulders in this way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, um, and uh, uh, it's exciting for them, uh, but they also uh, have a real uh, legitimate sense of, of being a part of something larger that's contributing uh, to the creation of new knowledge about the American Southwest. Uh, and I have a paper that I published in Plateau, which is the, the magazine of the Museum of Northern Arizona, it was in uh, 2005, and it was about our Perry Mesa survey and work I'd done with these folks. And I called them citizen archaeologists. Uh, and uh, I really think that's right. Uh, you know, they, they have an interest, they're citizens, they get out on the land, they hike, they hunt, they do other things, uh, they find these sites, they're intrigued by them, they're curious about them, they, they turn to people like me who studied, made a lifetime study of them uh, to help them uh, understand them better uh, and get engaged in, in uh, doing things to help record them and to get them into uh, permanent kinds of, of uh, databases that are available then uh, uh, in the modern historic preservation system uh, where if there's going to be some project that's going to put some house on top of that butte, before they do that maybe we can get some work done on that site that's there before that because we know it's there uh, and they've helped uh, you know, bring about that kind of knowledge. We actually were able at one point to participate in a historic preservation conference that the historic, the SHPO, the, the State Historic Preservation Officer uh, and his staff put on each year uh, a few years ago uh, about the contributions of avocational archeology span to uh, 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 historic preservation in Arizona, Peter Pillis and I, and, and we liked the way it worked out so well. We did it again at the Museum of Northern Arizona uh, and a guy in the society who's a filmmaker, a videographer and his wife, filmed it, and then they put it up on YouTube. So you guys can go to YouTube now and put in my name, I think you'd find it that way, or, or Jerry Earhart, uh, or Jim Graceffa, or, or other of these names, and find that. Uh, and I like the way that worked out so well, I got a, was able to get a, a humanities grant with the help of uh, a chapter of the Arizona Archaeology Society, uh, and we put on a symposium of professional archaeologists talking about our studies of Hoakam archaeology in that case, and that's all up on YouTube too. But it all comes out of that collaboration. I mentioned that the Verde Valley chapter paid for the production of this poster, so it's been a wonderful, uh, certainly from my point of view, a wonderful collaboration uh, for many, many years now. Well, let me just transition. Uh, in a couple of weeks, you'll be able to put in the name David Wilcox, and you'll get this uh, video tonight on YouTube as well. <laughs> So, Dave, thank you very much, and I think the, it's a really impressive, <laughs> not only people out on the ground working with archaeologists or doing surveys like this, but the site steward program. Was it 800 active site stewards, over 800 now? I mean, this state has got an amazing, engaged population uh, working with archaeologists, and events like this are very much what ways to give back and share that information. So again, we'll be back in the fall.